All right. We um, continue with the um, special passages on submission. Passages, of course, that um, cause us to uh, sit up and take note. And uh, Peter, in having given us already the, uh, the uh, introductory uh, challenge in verses 11 and 12 about our behavior being excellent so that uh, those who observe us can ultimately and only praise God because of how we responded. <clears throat> and then when it gets down to it, um, the Boy Scout activity of helping, you know, the old person cross the road, that's all good and well. Um, and things like that are appreciated. But Peter goes really beyond that to actually where we live and submitting ourselves to every form of um, authority over us as far as governments go. And uh, the challenge there and how he concludes that in verse 17 with honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And if we will allow ourselves to be challenged by just those four things, if we never did anything else the rest of our lives, we would have enough challenge to fill each day. But he doesn't stop there. Then he moves on to verses 18 through 20, uh, talking to the household servants and again, going back and just saying that that's really us. Uh, this is the, the, common, uh, the common person throughout the empire. Um, there were so many slaves, and uh, the house slave would have been more numerous, obviously, than certain other kinds. So um, he says, uh, submit to your masters, uh, to the good and to the bad. And... Uh, he then lays that out, what it looks like in verses 19 and 20, before he then really hits home on why we should do it in verses 21 through 25, where we are today. Um, and this is entitled, uh, Christ Our Example. Last week we covered Isaiah 53, which was the background for verses 25 through, uh, 21 through 25 today. But in verses 19 and 20... Uh, he tells what finds favor, and that's good. That's good response. It's bearing up um, under under suffering harshly for for doing the right thing. And uh, the challenge, of course, is if you do bad things and get clubbed for it, then that doesn't that doesn't do anything for anybody. But when you do the right thing and get clubbed for it anyway, and you um, bear up under it, God takes notice. God is observing. And uh, it matters to him what we do in the secrets of our heart, in our attitudes toward uh, life around us and injustices. And uh, he, he proceeds then to... Uh, connect the dots with that, with Jesus. And he does an excellent job. So in verse 21, he reminds us in that beginning, and verse, uh, verses 21 through 25 are broken out into two parts, and they're both in verse 21. The first part is, because to this you were called, to the bearing up, under harsh treatment, when you live in a manner that honors the Lord. That finds favor with God, and he says, and that's the whole conclusion, or, I'm sorry, the first part of the conclusion with that is you've been called unto this. And we could sit there and, you know, contemplate, but he, he doesn't, he doesn't, Stop there, and he immediately continues on with the second reason why we should uh, submit, despite the fact that we might potentially get clubbed for doing the right thing. And he says, 
because also Christ suffered instead of you. And then he'll unpack, unpack all of that. Because uh, he's gone from, God has called you to this, and uh, I don't know, it's almost like the guy who is uh, drafted into the army, and uh, you know the sergeant says, why are you here, soldier? Because I was drafted, sir. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to be here. And it's like, well, this is what you've been called. Well, I don't want to. It's like, well, it's not like too bad for you. Peter says, let me, let me make sense out of all this for you. He says, because also, not only have you been called to this, but I'm going to move your eyes away from your situation, and I want your eyes to focus upon Jesus. So just keep looking at him. Here we go. And he says, because Christ also suffered instead of you. Now, it doesn't read that way in the English. But the word is huper, which, which means in place of, but as I was looking, uh, in, even the lexicon says, instead of, beneficially. And as I was looking at that, it's like we already know, uh, um, and you've heard it, not, I don't say it often, but I will say it, the substitutionary death of Jesus. He was the substitute on whose behalf? On your behalf. So he died instead of you. He suffered instead of you. And that's really how it ought to read. We should have suffered, and he suffered instead of us. And right from the get-go, then, all of a sudden... We ought to, it should be a speed bump in our, in our attitude toward an attitude adjustment and toward further transformation. So in verse 21, he says, because Christ suffered instead of you, to you, and it immediately goes. That's how Peter uh, does it in the Greek. It, it goes, um, I'll, I'll read it in the Greek so you can hear it, just hear it, it's, whom own, whom in. Of you, that is to instead of you, to you. He, he jumps right in. And, and a, a Greek reader would realize that all of this, yeah, we're talking about Jesus, but it keeps coming back to how it relates to me. So instead of me and to me, he does something. To me, he leaves an example in order that following in the footsteps of him, we might do. This example that he left us, you know, this is the only place this word is used, and it's to write upon. And it would be, uh, many of us in here uh, are from the old school when they still had the letters up on the, uh, around the, the front of the room, and we would practice what was called penmanship. And so we would write our big B's and our little B's. And the teacher would do it, show us how, and then we would do it. And that's what this word is. It's to copy upon. You look, that's how it's done, and then you do it. That's what this word is. It's the only place it's used in the entire scriptures. Jesus suffered in the same way as us. That is, he did what was right. His whole life was what was right. And yet, in spite of that, and in a sense because of that, they hated him and they wanted to kill him, which is what they did. So in the same way that we suffer unjustly when we do the right thing. Jesus did that instead of you. And he left us an example in order that, and it's very clear, that we might follow in his footsteps. And it's not just 
a phrase. It, it's what is written there. Jesus has gone before us. Remember, Jesus, Peter is now saying, okay, I want, you to, I want your eyes to be on Jesus now as I talk to you. And so we look at Jesus, we see his life, we see the results of his perfect sinless life. Um, uh, as far as men were concerned, they put him up on the cross as a guilty villain, a criminal. And yet in God's sight, if you remember from Isaiah 53, God looked down and saw it and he was pleased and he was satisfied. The righteous demands of the payment that was due us was laid upon him. Another part that we'll get to in just a minute in the example. And it, it pleased God. It, it covered it. it. It paid the price. It was propitiation, satisfaction. It was finished. So... What we see then as we look at Jesus is we follow in his footsteps. And a part of that is to be maligned and misunderstood. In my Bible here, I've got two papers and it lists names. And they involve uh, uh, across the world, Pakistan and Sudan and Libya and Egypt and people, that is Christians, being killed uh, not just like, you know, pa-ching, pa-ching, but viol violently. I, I chose not to actually read the illustrations because they're <laughs> sickening. They're actually worse than Nazi Germany in World War II. It's horrendous. These people, all they're doing is following in, in Jesus' footsteps, and it's costing them. So Peter is saying, and this is verse 21, Jesus, or Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, also suffered instead of you to you, leaving behind an example in order that you might follow in the footsteps of him. Now, how does this example work? Peter gives us, and I forgot to look in, there's a, there's a uh, phrase, it's an English phrase, uh, and I'm, I get most English, but sometimes I get a little confused with the vocative and the um, pronomial uh, pronouns, and you go, yeah, okay, I'm lost too. And that's, but what, I'll, I'll just tell you what it is. There's four things in here in verses 22, 23, and 24 Four things that say, he who was. And it doesn't read that way in our English, but it's very clear, again, in the Greek. And so in verse 22, there's a he who was. In verse 23, there's a he who was. And then verse 24, there's two he who was. So the first example of he who was is in verse 22. And it says... He who committed no sin, nor was any guile, deceit, found in his mouth. So the first thing we're confronted with, and this is, remember I told you that he doesn't quote Isaiah 53, but he, um, uh, he almost quotes it. He uh, uh, alludes to it, brings it out here. He brings the thoughts to us. And I don't want to say quite summarize because that's the whole thing, really. He who did not bring about any sin. He didn't do sin. He didn't commit sin. And that's where you start. Jesus Christ was sinless. And we, we, we kind of get that, but it, it, goes, it goes further when it says, nor was any guile found in his mouth. And the significance of that is, and, and I've seen it with children, and I've learned to say, um, innocence doesn't impress me, but purity does. And the difference is that innocence simply means you perhaps haven't had the chance to go through it yet, but purity means you've had the chance and you've chosen to go through it and remain, how do you say, straight and, and pure, on, on the straight and narrow. However you want to say it, you've come through successfully uh, to the glory of God. 
So you have a, 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 a good boy, a good girl, a, a good man or a good woman, uh, because they, you know, they don't cheat on their wives or husbands, and they don't rob banks, and they go 65 down the freeway and not like Lidbeck, you know, 68 and a half. Actually, I drove about 62 this morning because we were early. Okay, sorry, that was a confession. You get a ticket for going too slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and all those people behind me were, no, anyway, yeah. <laughs> just kidding, that'll probably be deleted, but anyway, <laughs> oh, where was I, oh, <laughs> but it's when, you, see, deceit is in the heart, the heart is desperately wicked, who can even understand it, and when a person speaks from a, a heart of deceit, then you get into the whole realm of, of changing truth, veering, shading, moving away from. And so what if you don't rob a bank or, you know, whatever, but you, your speech reveals that there's something amiss here, there's something wrong. So when it says here, neither was deceit found in his mouth, we get the, we, we understand that there was nothing in here that was going to come out to violate perfection. So Jesus wasn't just sinless. He, it, it wasn't anywhere. It wasn't just the fact that his hands never did anything bad. It was that his heart, what came out was only truth. Only truth. Which is pretty powerful when you realize that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except for me. Except by me. So uh, this first example that uh, Peter gives us, he, Jesus committed no sin and there wasn't any uh, deceit found in him. The second thing in verse 23 <clears throat> is this. Uh, he who, uh, while being reviled, did not return the violation. And it's like, if I could say it this way, he who was fired upon but didn't return fire. He was constantly, and, and you can read it again in, the, in all of the Gospels, all he did was live his perfect life and he was reviled for it. But he never reviled back. And that's exactly how it says it. Suffering, he, um, while suffering, he... Uh, gave no threats, and this is how it reads, he gave back to the righteous judge. So, while fired upon, he didn't return fire, and while suffering, he didn't, re he didn't give back threats. But instead, it just judge. So, it was not bounced off of the violators against him, but rather it was bounced off against the righteous judge. And that's what Jesus did. So the little WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Um, is this. What would Jesus do? It tells us. He would take the injustice and then look above to the face of God, to the righteous judge and say, God, you know, you've got it under control. You know where I am, you know who I am, you know whose I am, and you know who they are. I leave it with you. And that's what verse 23 says. Um, verse 24. The first one says, and this is where uh, I told you last week that there's, there's more here than we uh, get to read in the English in, the, uh, in verse 24. The one who... <clears throat> carried up the sins of us upon himself. Upon the cross. He, and, and the picture here is twofold. And we, we get the idea of the, uh, of the raising of the, of the cross and Jesus being nailed upon it. Uh, and he carried the sins of us there. But the other image is the carrying up 
of the sin offering to the altar. And it's very clear here, as it's written, he himself, our sins, carried up upon the cross. In his own body. And you can't, you can't miss it. The, Jesus, again, we, I believe that you all understand that Jesus bore upon himself our sins. But the imagery here is that in the process of, of all the injustice done him, and as the cross was raised and we got to look upon him, he was bearing upon himself our sins at the same time in his own body. I mean, the imagery here is, is uh, humbling. That's all I can say, humbling. Um, and it doesn't stop there. The purpose of that, and, and this is another way that it's stated, in order that uh, the sins we might no longer exist to, the righteousness we might live to. And the, the, um, the way we would describe that, of course, is we die to sin, but we live to righteousness. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the word there isn't the same word that we use for dying. It's to be away from. It's to be disconnected with. It's away from the life. And I, I actually, this is what uh, Lenski's translation says. Um, carried up our sins in his body on the cross in order that having ceased to exist for the sins. Having ceased to exist. And that's just a little bit different than having died to sins. We don't even exist toward it anymore, is what he's saying. That's the power of the separation of the uh, darkness from the light, of the life from the concept of death, of eternity in the presence of God, and the eternity in the, in the away from the presence of God. He says that having ceased to exist for the sins, we may live for the righteousness. And that leaves us, again, as, as I've stated in the past, we have no wiggle room to argue. We have no wiggle room to argue. It's not about me. I have, as my own entity, as my own God, have ceased to exist for my glory. I exist for his glory, for his righteousness, to reflect him, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And these are powerful images for us to connect with. Not frightening, just powerful. So we have the first, he who, and that was he committed no sin, and there wasn't any deceit found in his mouth. And the second one, he who, uh, when fired upon, did not return fire, or when he was reviled, he didn't revile back. Uh, neither did he utter any threats, uh, but instead he kept giving him back, uh, himself back to the one who judges righteously. And then the third thing, the beginning of verse 24, is he who bore himself, himself bore our sins, uh, or carried up our sins in his own body on the cross in order that we might cease to exist to the sins and live for the righteousness. The fourth one, and it's a sleeper because of the way that all the translations translated, we skip over the he who, which there's four of them. And we don't want to skip the fourth. He who, to, um, he who, 
by the wounds we were healed. And that's one of those things that when we look at the picture, and as I described last week from Isaiah 53, uh, Isaiah 53, we're not talking about physical healing here. We're in the context of our sins and transgressions and our iniquities in the sight of a righteous God and how Jesus has been dealing with those. So we're not talking about physical healing. Please never go there. Let's go to the context of what we're talking about. By his wounds, what did he do? The, the, and the wounds, I mean, you could image the, uh, the cat and nine tails upon him, but the wounds were, were everything. It, it was each harsh word against the righteous Jesus. It was each slap or slug or fist or pound on the crown of thorns or lash on the, lash on the back or nail in the hand. It was each of those. By his wounds, you and I have been healed. Of what? Of the greatest impossible sickness, and that is sin. And it's one of those things that when we begin to look at it uh, with spiritual eyes, in the context of the passage, by his wounds, we have been healed, very pithy, very short, very succinct, and yet the contemplation of that, if that's all we said, now that I've explained that it's not physical healing, um, when we look at the cross, when we have communion, by his wounds we have been healed. You, you get the major, massive uh, connection between his telling us to submit to authority, to submit to our masters, and then we look at Jesus, and we look at him, and we see his example, and we see his footsteps, we see where they led, we see the cross, and then we see what all of that accomplished on our behalf, and we say, then how can I not live for him in the way that he's asked me to live. And what happens then when someone shows up at the church door with a gun and says, if you're a Christian, I want you to come outside and we're going to line you up and we're going to shoot you. If you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, then don't worry about it. Just stay in the church and, and we'll just leave and you guys will be fine. And it's like, well... If I'm a Christian, well, I'm a Christian. And they're gonna, I'm going to go out there and they're going to kill me. It's like, hmm, well, it's kind of a heavy-duty type of thing. And the only reason I mention it, the likelihood of that happening here is pretty slim. But the likelihood of that happening, I mean, there was a priest killed in his own church by an extremist, a Muslim extremist, um, during church. Where was this church? It was in France. It wasn't in Sudan. It wasn't in Egypt. It wasn't in Saudi Arabia. It was in France. So when he says, submit yourselves and then follow Christ's example, <clears throat> that's what he says. He who, he who, he who, and he who. He concludes with verse 25. And the, conclu the conclusion is the conclusion of uh, verses 18 through 20, the patiently enduring while we are doing well, or doing good for God, doing, doing the righteous thing, uh, living for God. So the conclusion is this. For you as sheep were straying, Okay, now we're, remember, we're concluding. So Peter is looking back, and he's, and he's said all these things. He's talked about our behavior, talked about the world watching us, talking about um, all the things, um, uh, doing the will of God, acting as free men, loving our, our uh, brotherhood, uh, fearing God, honoring the king, 
submitting to our masters, uh, maybe getting pummeled, even if you do the right thing. And he concludes and he reminds us, for as sheep, you were straining. Then he puts in the, the huge adversative. <clears throat> but now, having turned back upon the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And this is, this is now who we are. That's what we were. We were sheep that were constantly saying, there's the shepherd. Oh boy, let's go over here. There's the shepherd. There's his voice. I hear his voice. Oh boy, let's go over here. That's, that's who we were. And now he says, but you have turned back. We've seen that before. This word is translated, uh, converted in Acts. And it's... Um, we saw it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, where the testimony had gone out into the world and we were those who had turned away from, from idols to the living God. And so his image here in his conclusion is you were sheep that strayed all over there, but now because of Jesus, because of the sacrifice, because of he bore your sins, because you've been healed uh, by him spiritually, you have turned back unto or upon the shepherd, which is a good illustration. He could have stopped there, but he didn't. He added the word episkopos, which is overseer. That's translated bishop in certain translations. Um, you kind of go, well, that's an that's English word that we have made that mean, and it simply means overseer. So the one who looks over your soul, not over your shoulder, but over your soul, the shepherd who leads you, the one who then superintends and overlooks looks over you, uh, that's who you've turned to. So instead of heading over there and saying, you know what, I know what Jesus would do, but you know what, that guy cut me off. Or that guy did this, or that guy did that, or that guy, uh, I mean, a friend of mine has been uh, at his work for many, many years. He's in a supervisorial show, uh, position. They hired a young man, and the young man who does the same thing as his, as he does, gets a higher pay. And you go, that's not fair. I know what Jesus would do, but I'm going to be angry. Um, those things happen. How do we respond? We look at Jesus. We look at the cross. We look at his hands. We look at what he carried up, up uh, on his own body onto the cross. And then we remember what we were, B.C., before Christ, and what we are now. The shepherd leads us. Our overseer oversees us. And uh, to find favor, to put a smile on God's face, means that we always remember Jesus in the equation. Not necessarily easy to do, but it's all part of the transforming transformation that we are. Father, uh, we are in constant need. We uh, have our old ways, and we need to shed those. We were one thing, but now we're another. We had one response, but now we need to respond as you have instructed us. Or it is not easy, and yet we find that as we give that to you, somehow you meet the need. Somehow you are there. Somehow you ease the pain. Somehow you make it work. We don't know. We don't understand. There's so many things we don't, but we know what you said. So God, give us the daily grace we need to remember and then the daily grace we need to obey. So, Lord, go before us. Take us from where we are and lead us to where we need to be. For Christ's sake, amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>